This is a Fox News alert. A treasure trove of brand new documents belonging to Osama bin Laden released this morning. They were found the night that the Navy SEALs raided his compound in Pakistan, killing the terror leader. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Outnumbered. I'm Andrea Tanteros, and here with us today, Sandra Smith, Kimberly Guilfoyle, political commentator and national spokeswoman for the Libre Initiative, Rachel Campos Duffy, and today's hashtag one lucky guy, the perfect one today, Mike Ooh. Baker, <laughs> former CIA covert operations officer and president and co-founder of the private intelligence and security firm Diligence LLC. Mike Baker's outnumbered. Oh, after that title, that's all the time we got. I mean, that's what I'm going to say. We're outnumbered by your bio Drive point. Safe, <laughs> we are dying to hear what you think about these uh, bin Laden documents that everyone's been pouring over. So let's get right yeah, to the news. Fascinating day. Really fascinating. Now to those documents uncovered at Osama bin Laden's compound. The information released approximately four years after the 2011 raid that ended with the terror leader's death. Here he is in that compound. Those documents shedding new light on bin Laden's life and how he remained obsessed with attacking Americans until the very end. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harris joins us now with the details. Catherine. Well, thank you, Andrea. We're going document by document here at Fox, and so far, they paint a picture of bin Laden issuing orders from his compound in Pakistan, micromanaging to the smallest detail, and kind of wearing many managerial hats. This document, in fact, is an application to become a suicide bomber, asking the applicant for their history, their personal information, and even an emergency contact in the event that they do become a martyr. Another document reviewed by Fox shows how paranoid the al-Qaeda leader had become after more than a decade on the run and with a $25 million bounty on his head. One of his wives was coming from Iran to Pakistan for a visit, and he ordered that she leave all her personal belongings behind. Quote, Everything that a needle might possibly penetrate. Some chips have been lately developed for eavesdropping so small they could easily be hidden inside a syringe. Bin Laden also writes about the Arab Spring in 2012 and on the one hand celebrates the overthrow of dictators like the Tunisian leader Ben Ali while at the same time there is this anxious tone, kind of a how will al-Qaeda remain relevant in this changing landscape. The documents recovered from the compound four years ago are being released now because legislated, le legislation pardon me, mandated their declassification. The former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Mike Flynn, recently told Fox's Brett Baer that millions of documents were recovered in Abbottabad and there was a conscious decision not to exploit them at the time and review them, claiming that he was told basically to stop. What's more important, Flynn uh, makes the assessment that the documents showed some operational connections between bin Laden and the affiliates that were operating in North Africa, East Africa, and Yemen, uh, not that he was so isolated that he had lost control of the network. Andrea. Catherine, really interesting stuff. Thank you. You're welcome. Mike, what jumps out at you the most reading these documents? Well, I, first of all, you have to think about what the time frame is. So it's, it's been going on four years since the raid uh, on uh, bin Laden. And some of this material he was writing ahead of the anniversary of 9-11, the 10-year anniversary of 9-11. Mm -hmm. So you have to put it in context there with now what's happening, right? Because it, it, some people have been amazingly quick. I mean, these, these things were just released, right? And some people are already out there saying, well, look, it shows that he doesn't agree with what the Islamic State is doing. Well, you're not, you know, putting all of the time frame into context. There's no way he could have imagined what would have happened four years on from where he was writing at that point in time. But I think that part of what you're seeing is also um, just the, the, the musings of an individual who, while not uh, completely isolated, uh, was disconnected to some degree uh, from the operational day to day, and so I think, in part, not to play you know you know uh, armchair psychologist, yeah. but I think he was looking for ways to be relevant in a sense. I do like I think my favorite comment out of so far what we've seen is where he says hey, those Iranians they can't be trusted. So <laughs> yeah. if if Bin Laden knows that then you'd like to think that our own administration 
Bef would have a handle on it. Before we open it up to the couch to ask more questions of you, I want to go back to something that you said because this is what folks are focusing on. He encouraged al-Qaeda affiliates to abandon this caliphate. Now this is the biggest goal of ISIS and instead focus on killing Americans, bombing embassies, put the caliphate on hold, he said. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that led to the rise of ISIS? Because they said, you know what, we have different priorities here. The caliphate's the main goal. Bin Laden wants us to kill Americans. Mm -hmm. We're going to prioritize here. And do you think that could have led to the formation of what we're seeing now? Well, I, no, I think what led to the formation now is the chaos that was created by a vacuum in, in Iraq. I mean, I don't think that's, that's rocket science, but I think that, you know, he wanted a caliphate. Bin Laden was, was yeah, he was all about the caliphate. You can argue in terms of how he felt about, uh, about violence among the, the, the sects and about, you know, Shia, you know, fighting Sunni. And, but at he the end like of the day, it. well, he, he was, no, I mean, he was, he was, you know, arguing against it uh, mm -hmm. often. But at the same time, would a, you know, would this now territorial, this physical manifestation of a caliphate, would it excite him? Now, of course it would. He'd be, and he would be looking for ways to capitalize on it from his perspective. There were always leadership battles within al-Qaeda. There were always efforts trying to, you know, to figure out who was going to you know, succeed him. But at the end of the day, they're all jonesing for the caliphate. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really interesting. What stuck out to me is I'm always following the money trail when it comes to these terrorist groups. And when it comes to al-Qaeda, it appears by some of the memos that were written to Osama bin Laden that they were strapped for cash. Al-Qaeda members were actually writing uh, in one memo, they clearly wrote that there's this financial problem, it was written. And, and Osama bin Laden stressed that he was concerned about the effects of climate change on the Muslim world, uh, talking about let's not deplete the precious groundwater. He was talking about ways to store wheat because he, he was fretting about food security was often what he was writing about. Yeah. The, the finances behind Al-Qaeda were obviously a, a huge concern for him. Well, yeah, and that's, and that's you know, they've solved that problem in part by, by having physical territory, right? Because that gives them revenues, whether it's through extortion, uh, criminal activity, the oil and gas revenues that we've been hearing about. Uh, you know, you also have to look in terms of why release this now. And I don't want to sound skeptical. Mm. Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> but they've had this information for a long time. Mm. The first thing you do when you sweep up all this material is you immediately look for actionable leads, right? You immediately look for, oh, that's the compound in the bottom about calling. <laughs> yeah. uh, is that Mrs. Baker? Yeah, that, no, that, no yeah. otherwise I would take that call, I'm even on say. national TV. I apologize. <laughs> uh, but you, what you do is you sweep up all that intel, and you immediately look for actionable sure. leads. You immediately look for anything that's going to be perishable. Mm -hmm. And then you start going through everything. You prioritize, and you layer it in different tiers to use that. Three years on, three and a half years on, we're now seeing some of this material. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think that the reason this is happening is because the administration needs some good news. They're doing a, a deflection, which they have done many times in the past. To remind they're, they're the American public yeah. of their biggest... Well, attack. yeah, they're taking a beating on everything else going on in Middle East strategy. Oh, look at this. Did you see the Bin Laden but, documents? Yeah, but now we're in a worse position than we were before. And despite the gains that we had made, we let it go. We let it slip through our hands because this administration was reluctant to have a real plan and focus on terror in the Middle East. And you've seen ISIS step into what you have described as the vacuum in Iraq, and it's dispersed. I mean, it's really spread and metastasized. Right, right absolutely. I, I think one of the interesting things that came out of this was, you know, who knew that terrorists actually love some of their wives? Um, I thought that the interesting love letters to um, well, yeah, not, not, not love. Not one, not one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I thought yeah. found it really interesting. But what do these documents tell you about how we should be adjusting our strategy? I think that's really the bottom line question that a lot of Americans have. Well, I mean, you know, again, we could pause. Or any, we can, or is yeah, there anything? We can look at the personality issues and the psychology of it all. Bin Laden sitting in there, and and and, and hopefully there, there's nothing actionable in the material that we're getting right now. It's all been you know scrubbed clean and, and any leads were, were, were used and that's a good thing uh, what we need to do now in terms of strategy is we need to, we need to win but first we need to find a strategy mm -hmm. then once we have that strategy we need to act it out and and we're not doing that right now we have we, a lot of resources though I mean the men that I've talked to in the intelligence mm -hmm. community and people at your organization that they have a lot of tools available to them it's not just about putting ground troops down that isn't necessary people jump to that as right. oh, okay well this is the ultimate extreme but there's many things that we can do with covert operations and special forces absolutely and, and, and again you have to you know you don't want to be that, that that person that has a dog in the hunt and never points out the good things that the other sure. side is doing so the Abu Sayyaf raid that's a good thing the thousands of airstrikes that we've been doing that's a good thing that the administration is conducting but at the end of the day, we're not going to take back that territory and hold it and actually create some order out of this chaos without 
people on the ground, mm -hmm. and we're not going to get the Iraqi army. To Mike, can I ask you about the, yeah. these in these documents as well? Bin Laden writes about drones. Mm -hmm and how much he disliked drones. And he writes, they are concerning <laughs> and exhausting us. I mean, this guy was a meticulous editor that really mused about all sorts of things, and yeah. we were finding out. But drones specifically, I mean, besides the rise of technology, he talks about drones. What does that tell you about our fight going forward? That seems to be one of the areas that this administration is pretty comfortable with. Right, and, and again, you, giving credit where it should be, the, the, the Obama administration uh, ramped up the drone campaign, much to the displeasure of the far left, and it's been very successful. It is a very effective tool, and as, as Kimberly pointed out, mm -hmm. you have to use all the tools. This is not a one thing or the other. Right. Mm -hmm. This is not we'll do an air campaign and we you know, rule out everything else. You have to use all the, the, the resources in your kit bag, and the drone uh, program has been extremely effective. Keep it up. Yeah, keep it up. You have to keep moving. And you see the concern that it raises. And yeah. he's absolutely right. When he talks about how we've lost a lot of our cadre, a lot of our leaders, of course they have. And it keeps them on the back foot. You know, the more that you can keep them guessing, mm -hmm. uh, so we have to do that. Yeah, we have but Mike, to, it know. doesn't operate in and of itself. It, it works really well in, you know, when you pair it with intelligence, with real-time intelligence coming from actually having people on the mm. ground so it can be more surgical and precise. Absolutely. So you're either counting on what? You're counting on the local military, the Iraqi military, you're counting on your liaison partners, whomever they may be, the Saudis or the Jordanians or whomever, or you've got your own boots on the ground. And that's where we're lacking right now. We don't have our own personnel on the ground directing airstrikes in the most efficient manner. Manner. We're trying, but not in the most efficient manner. And at the end of the day, what do we need to be doing? We need to be doing a lot more of the Abu Sayyaf type raids, as you sure. pointed out. Well, even though you talked about this is not the distraction of the day, but this is what people are talking about. That's the ultimate debate that we're debating here at home that we will go back to. All right, Hillary Clinton finally taking reporters' questions yesterday, breaking what has been nearly a month long media silence. But one columnist says it failed to address what he calls her credibility gap. We'll debate that. Plus, a summer rite of passage for Boy Scouts. No more. The group announcing a ban on water gun fights and limits on the size of water balloons. Yeah, water balloons. But are these rule changes really necessary? And have the Boy Scouts given in to the PC police? Rachel's got thoughts on that. Mother of seven? Yes. Wow. And two boys. And right after the show, catch more from the couch on the web. Join us for Outnumbered Overtime by logging onto foxnews.com slash outnumbered. We've got Mike Baker here, so click the OT tab if you've got questions about what it's like to be, I don't know, Mike Baker, international man <laughs> to be on this sofa. <laughs> and who was calling him? We'll reveal who called him during the show. We'll see you at Overtime. <laughs>